Welcome back at the Center for Economic Policy Research. We bring you the most important new research on the economic impact of COVID-19. My name is Tim Phillips. Could COVID-19 mortality possibly mirror the data from the flu pandemic of a century ago? And if so, what is it about those countries that suffered in 1918 that stopped them from learning from experience a century later? Well, Chris Meissner of UC Davis and his co-author Peter Lynn have been investigating whether, when it comes to fighting pandemics, history is indeed destiny. Chris, welcome. Thank you. Now, how similar has the overall mortality rate from COVID-19 been, Chris, when you compare it to the flu pandemic 100 years ago? Yeah, well, the... Flu in 1918 was much more deadly than COVID-19. You have to keep in mind that flu in 1918 killed about 50 to 65 million people worldwide. So that's a lot of uh, people um, relative to the population at the time. I think the best estimate right now about the, cu the case fatality rate is that the flu in 1918 was about 2.5%, whereas for COVID-19, it's a bit lower, maybe at like 1%. So this is a little bit less deadly. Um, and it's certainly uh, this time around less deadly than SARS, uh, MERS, and Ebola, which has a fatality rate of 50%. The, Still, commonality, yes. sorry, the commonality between the two is that um, as pandemics go, the flu from 1918 as well as COVID-19 have had you know, massive global implications, unlike the other ones I mentioned. Well, that's it. Still above 1%. We would expect to maybe do a little bit better. Is, is there a message in that? Yeah, it's an interesting point. You would think after 100 years of uh, you know, scholarship, of public health that's been uh, you know, an active field of research for over 150 years, century of economic growth, um, you know, learning from these different pandemics that we've had, and you know, certainly the uh, message of preparedness for a pandemic had been around for the last several decades. The CDC, the World Health Organization, and um, other local uh, health organizations had been aware of the potential you uh, would think that uh, we would be much better prepared this time around. <laughs> now, in this paper, you set out to find out whether the mortality rate in the previous pandemic predicts the mortality rate from COVID-19 for a country or for a, a region. When you set out to do this, did you really expect to find a strong relationship? Not really. Um, you know, we certainly observed in the early weeks of March uh, a major health catastrophe unfolding in places like Italy, then Spain and France, even in parts of the United States, such as New York and New Jersey. Um, the other interesting observation was that there were other places in the world, um, notably East Asia, which was um, seemingly doing a little bit better. Uh, certainly the alarm was sounded in China early on and um, you know, a lot of bad things happened in China as far as we could tell, but um, the disparity in, in the two um, made us wonder a little bit, you know, what determines the out, you know, public health outcomes in a comparative perspective. So we went, um, you know, looking into the deeper determinants and, um, you know, uh, being economic historians, the both of us are interested in public health, we uh, naturally focused on the historical angle um, and, you know, we can discuss the rest in, in a couple of moments, but um, we, I don't think we expected that. Like we said, I think we thought we would do better this time around. Now, you're going back a century to get the data from the flu pandemic. How much data is there about that? Where do you find it? Yeah, um, surprisingly, um, at the time, uh, people did uh, start to keep track of these things. As I said, public health has been around for, uh, as a, as a, in, field of investigation for over 150 years. So there's quite some data. Um, we followed uh, some earlier data sets uh, managed and put together by people like Jose Orsua and uh, Robert Barrow at Harvard, as well as some other public health experts who have mined the mortality data and looked at so-called excess mortality in the past. So I, I have a um, pretty strong confidence in the mortality data from 1918. Um, you know, despite, uh, you know, 
you know, that kind of uh, claim. Uh, they are historical data and some of the countries in particular that we might look at would, would have some uh, issues. But I think overall, they give us a good indication of how bad things were in 1918. Yeah. Uh, you're investigating persistence for countries with a century difference between the, the two occurrences. What does that mean you have to control for? Well, naturally, a lot of things. Um, uh, early on in the COVID-19, one of the hypotheses that uh, surfaced uh, was that um, maybe East Asia was doing a little bit better than uh, other places because of their collectivist culture. And that was in turn a, a function of the disease environment over the centuries. Um, so there's kind of an evolutionary view there. That really got me thinking about what the deep determinants of public health might be over the long run. Um, so we controlled for whether countries are collectivist or so-called individualist. We controlled for whether um, countries have a Confucian tradition, which is really just a control for countries in East Asia. Um, we think it matters. Uh, uh, maybe it's associated with greater trust in public health officials and bureaucracies. We'll talk about that in a moment, I think. Another uh, feature we needed to control for was past exposure to pandemics. Here we want to think about SARS, which was notably important in 2002 and three, so past crises. Um, there are a range of other fixed effects, such as regional fixed effects and time trends that are less interesting. But um, I think you know those, uh, plus you know the obvious things like GDP per capita and population density are the interesting things. Yeah. And so for European, uh, North American countries, uh, I think you did American cities as well. Did you find persistence between the flu pandemic and COVID-19? Yeah, I think overall we do find uh, persistence um, across uh, our sample of countries and 45 US cities. Um, you know, uh, so that is one message we can talk about some of the nuance there as we go on the particular cases. As far as persistence goes, um, yes, U.S. cities show strong persistence. We looked at cities like New York City, which were, um, which, you know, had a devastating uh, death toll this time around. And in 1918, it did not do so well either. Other places like New Jersey, Philadelphia, uh, Detroit, New Orleans, and the United States have done poorly this time and uh, in 1918 as well. Um, so, uh, you know, it's uh, the correlation over time uh, almost just pops out uh, at you. If you look at our paper, we have a pretty simple scatter plot with a very strong positive correlation amongst U.S. cities. Yeah. And so for these places, what can we argue that is constant over time? Is it their actions or their attitudes? That's a really interesting question. Um, we've done our best to control for um, things that are fixed over time and uh, persistent themselves that could determine uh, this. So there are many potential drivers, uh, you know, the investments in public health, uh, and the strategic investments um, that must be undertaken. You know, it's not clear that cities have done that over time. Um, you know, in the past, it was uh, you know, less common. Uh, today, government budgets are under stress for many reasons, not just, uh, you know, a partisan divide, but, you know, the legacy of the 2008 crisis. So these investments seem to play out at the individual and policy level um, in these two pandemics. But um, I think really what we're finding is that active decision-making process in the early stages of the pandemic are important. You know, how do public health officials and political leaders react? How do individuals react to the announcements they make and how do they behave? What level of trust is there in local officials? And I think those things are um, dynamic within the moment that a pandemic starts, but also persistent. And so um, you know, I think uh, you know, officials in the places that have been hit worst have moved from outright neglect to uh, stronger action, whereas the places that did better, you know, were, were you know, had a strong response from the beginning. 
let me tell you an historical a- anecdote, if I might. I mean, Philadelphia, yes. Philadelphia hasn't done so well uh, this time around. And in 1918, it's famous for letting a uh, large uh, public gathering to sell bonds for World War I, a Liberty Bond rally go ahead. Uh, it's compared to St. Louis, which canceled its bond rally and um, did you know, relatively well in that period. Um, there are anecdotes this time around. San Francisco mayor, London Breed, um, was cautioning people to stay home early on, early on and San Francisco's done remarkably well. Um, not so in New York. Mayor de Blasio told people to go out, have a good time, have a few drinks and see a show uh, in early March, which is just inexplicable. Yeah, that turns into perhaps one of the worst pieces of advice that has been offered on COVID-19, doesn't it? But let's mm. focus on those countries that you said have done better. What's, uh, what do they have in common? Right. Um, so the interesting thing that comes out as well in our study, in my mind, is that uh, the East Asian countries have done relatively well, they've had superior performance compared to many countries um, in, in Western Europe and in uh, the US, for example. And uh, the key uh, factors here are probably two. One is the experience with SARS in 2002 and three. SARS left a searing memory of the danger of these um, pandemics. East Asian countries had a high level of preparedness because of that. Um, they also have a high level of trust in their public health officials, and um, uh, I think that led to people listening uh, better and taking greater care. We often hear about these countries, it's sort of dismissed that there is a sort of cultural difference. People do what they're told, uh, everyone acts in, this, in the same way, that, these sort of vague things. Is it possible to control for that very well in the data? Um, it's an interesting point. Yeah, I mentioned collectivist versus individualist uh, cultures, and, and actually that's a long-running debate in public health. You know, can individualist uh, societies fight a pandemic? Can they make those public health sacrifices that they need to? So we were interested in that, and we controlled for it. And it turns out not to matter. So um, it doesn't seem to matter. But the difference uh, seems to be more about trust. If you look at the level of trust that these East Asian countries have in their public health officials and bureaucracies, it's remarkably higher than in Western countries and compared to the global averages. According to the World Health, uh, sorry, the World Values Survey, uh, East Asian countries have a 50% percent approval uh, in terms of their uh, trust in their bureaucrats, whereas Western European countries may be 42 percent. So there's a big gap in trust of public officials between these places, and, and that matters. So uh, I don't think it's that hard to, to understand or control for, um, but um, you know, uh, it, it's a little bit surprising that it's not the collectivist versus individualist, and it's, it's something even more basic than that, just trust. Yes, you, you pick out a, a paper that uh, mentions, was it hubris, isolation, and distrust uh, as factors. Can we pick out hubris, isolation, and distrust as perhaps some of the uh, features that are driving mortality in 2020 and drove mortality a century earlier? Yeah, well, sure, there are many. Um, you have Trump, of course. So, um, you know, not a lot to say there, but his... Uh, willingness to withdraw the United States from the World Health Organization is a signal of uh, his isolationism. Um, you know, people don't trust him here. His hubris is evident. Um, imposing travel bans um, is a strategy, one of many that countries take. The U.S. was one of the first countries to impose a travel ban. Places like China. Um, interestingly, uh, places like South Korea and Japan did not do this, and yet they perform better. So tell me about uh, how isolationism works in that case. Um, in the hubris, uh, you know, Trump, but there are others in Milan, the uh, mayor was famous for going on record saying, uh, you know, Milan keeps moving. Uh, the prime minister is from a so-called populist movement. It's not obvious that, um, you know, uh, you know the, the experts are being listened to and that, um, you know, people are, are paying attention to past learning. You know, uh, in Germany, there's been a lot of success 
Um, they got down to business, did testing, tracing. Um, people have trusted their uh, officials and it's gone relatively well. Take Sweden, uh, high mortality rate in relative terms this time around. Um, you know, they didn't do a strong lockdown. They thought people would take the appropriate action. Um, I guess that's a form of hubris. Uh, we can conquer this together. Um, it hasn't worked out too well. And moreover, elderly have suffered in, in Sweden um, in, in some of the nursing homes. So, um, so I'd like to add one last thing you know, on this. Um, I think it's really interesting and really important that we evaluate this issue of trust. Um, Guido Alfani and co-authors at Bocconi University have highlighted that past pandemics erode trust in societies. And what we're finding is that trust matters. So if you put those two together and think forward, we really have to evaluate how this pandemic is eroding trust and how it may have impacts in the future. It may very well be worthwhile to take some time to invest in in, in, in recovering some of that lost trust from this pandemic. Because if we don't, it's very likely the next pandemic, which will surely come, could be even worse. So I, I think it's really important that policymakers pay attention to that. Uh, that's very interesting. I, it turns out that history may not be destiny for everybody, but there are definitely echoes of history in what we're seeing here. And as you say, really important lessons for the future. Chris, thank you very much. Very welcome. Thank you for having me. Now, the, this paper is in issue 15 of COVID economics. It's called A Note on Long-Run Persistence of Public Health Outcomes in Pandemics. Uh, the authors are Peter Zhijian Lin and Christopher Meissner, and you're definitely going to want to read it. It's fascinating reading. But keep in touch with all the COVID-19 coverage at Fox EU. There's tons of it now, and there's more every time you look. So for Chris, myself and everyone at the CEPR, good for goodbye for now and stay positive by staying negative. <laughs>